featuring the Greenfield Gunner, Mike Edwards, former Maryville Scott, Donnie Moore, former UT coach, Ray Trail, from the Daily Times, Marcus Fitzsimmons, and Troy Provo Heron. <clears throat> Hello, everybody, and greetings from the Blue Tick Tavern in downtown Maryville. I'm Mike Edwards, the Greenfield Gunner, along with Donnie Moore and Marcus Fitzsimmons, and this is the Goatee Sports Page. National basketball champions are waiting to be crowned and we're going to the whistle blows. And now let's set today's lineup card, sponsored by Blunt Partnership. The University of Tennessee Sports Report, sponsored by the Cherokee Group and the Murphy's Bobcat SEC Notebook, lead off with Marcus Fitzsimmons and Donnie Moore. Today we'll look back on the Vols' Elite Eight game against Purdue and talk about the future of Vol basketball. Donnie Moore will update us on high school scores and news from around the area. And then mark it down with Marcus Fitzsimmons, sponsored by Mandy B. Street Realty, features Maryville High School Tennis. The Anderson Lumber Company Player of the Week will be announced, featuring Marcus Fitzsimmons, as William Blunt Softball will be on the agenda. Donnie Moore returns to discuss headlines from around the sports world before the Boyd Sports Spotlight shines on the termination of Lady Vol basketball coach Kelly Harper and the NCAA basketball finals. And finally, the bowl prediction segment closes the show as our Goatee Sports Page panel goes out on a limb to pick, pick their NCAA basketball champions. And now it's time for the Cherokee Group UT Sports Report and Murphy's Bobcat SEC Notebook featuring Marcus Fitzsimmons and Donnie Moore. And we have ex-Alcoa basketballer Dwayne Easter also on board this morning. Welcome back, everybody, to another week on the Goatee Sports page. And uh, uh, it's been a disappointing week. You know, this time last week we were all sitting here and everybody in this area <laughs> had Final Four <laughs> fever, buddy. It was Final Four fever. Yeah. And who, who uh, would ever believe that uh, – as close as Tennessee basketball came to that Final Four, that we'd be sitting here this week and a uh, little bit depressing, isn't it, Donnie? <laughs> huh? yeah, indeed. We're, yeah, we're, it is. We're you know, sitting and everybody's like, sitting home now, yeah. watching instead of uh, participating. Yeah, and, uh, that is a little disappointing. Dwayne, it's sort of like uh, the way it's been with UT sports. They get you right there <laughs> and you're ready to go, and then they just drop you like a lead ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, uh, yeah. And in this one, they waited the last three or four minutes to do it. That's even that's even harder to take, huh? Yeah, it was disappointing, yeah. really disappointing. Yeah. So. Donnie Moore, uh, I'm going to start off with a little letter rip this morning, and and uh, I, I I don't uh, I've got uh, Danny White on the agenda this morning. Oh, <laughs> Danny's on the – he's getting I ripped. Hate, <laughs> that, I hate that's to, Tony's cousin, right? I know, but <laughs> yeah, I, I, right. Really, I really hate to do this to Danny White because I really – I like him. Yeah. I really do like him, and, you know, he's done a really great job over there, and all the sports programs seem to be coming to uh, together and uh, heading in the right direction. But uh, Got to keep him humble, though, right? Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to humble him up a little bit here this week, so let's – Let's get with it, okay? All right, let's go. Hey, this past Monday, the University of Tennessee parted ways with Lady Vols basketball coach Kelly Harper. In her five years at the helm of the Lady Vol program, she compiled an overall record of 108 and 52 and was 53 and 24 in conference play. Forget the stats, Kelly Harper was relieved of her duties because she stayed well behind the ghost of Pat Head Summit. She could not corral an NCAA championship, could not even get close. But did UT Athletic Director Danny White handle the termination the way it should have been handled? I don't think so. The sly Danny White waited a few days after to dismiss her so UT would not have to pay her $4.2 million, but instead opted to hand her a check for $2.2 million or thereabouts. Scrooge White thanked <laughs> Kelly Harper for her love and passion for <laughs> UT and her accomplishment of playing on three Lady Vol National Championship teams. All sounded good coming from someone who still has his job, but his words were still not worth the extra $2 million. If it was Philip Fulmer under the exact same situation, UT would have gladly paid him the $4.2 million and would have probably thrown in another $2 million on top of that because he was just a good old Tennessee boy. And how about Bruce Pearl if he were in the exact situation? 
he would have definitely gotten the $4 million, even though he could not keep his players out of trouble and couldn't even recognize his own backyard when questioned by the NCAA. And finally, left the UT program in disgrace, having embarrassed the university and the entire state on the national level. Harper should have been paid the $4.2 million. The university extended her contract three of her five years. If money was tight on the hill, Danny White's reasoning could have been more understanding. But UT throws around millions like a drunk at a Las Vegas gambling table. <laughs> Pay her the $2 million and hire someone else to chase the ghost. <laughs> Mike, the thing you've got to remember is Kelly was a UT student. She was a Lady Vol. And anybody who has been a UT student knows that you can go to the UT bookstore and there's a hardware section and you open up a little drawer and you can get your big orange screw right out of there. She knows what <laughs> UT can do too. She was a student. She she knew what was she knew what the magic date was that she had to be nervous. You know what? I've been down here since 1969, Donnie Moore. Yes, you have. And I'm going to tell you something. There has never been a coach that has left this program in good taste. Every one of them, I don't care what sport it was, has been fired and, 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 and has left in a bad way. The only one I can remember is uh, Doug Dickey, and he left before they had a chance to fire him. He went down to Florida, <laughs> and then they cussed him for going down there and leaving the program. Yeah. He probably was the smartest one of the whole bunch. But everybody, every basketball coach I've ever known has been fired. Baseball coach has been fired. Yeah. And, and you say, well, Pat had some of it, but, you know, that wasn't a real pleasant deal. No, you know, I mean, it wasn't no. a real pleasant deal. There were a lot of people unhappy about that and not really sure whether Pat wanted to step down or not, uh, well, but they but just kind of Mike, decided. you're talking UT is the one who does the breaking up. I guess. They don't want to be the one that gets jilted but, and left for somebody else. They'd rather break up with you than wait around for you to break up with them. wouldn't it be really nice if somebody says, well, you know, I'm just going to retire. You know, when they have a retirement party for <laughs> them and maybe give them a car. And, or, you yeah, know, I mean, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. I mean, Rick yeah. Barnes, you know, he's been coaching 38 years. Everybody kind of loves him right now. Maybe it'll happen with him. Could be. I don't he know. He could be the first. So it far, be. it hadn't happened with anybody else. No. So, we'll see. <laughs> I thought they'd give her another year. I honestly did, but. Yeah, we were talking about it, what, a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, we, we, just, did. we did. We all thought, well, you know, maybe she'll make some adjustments on the on her. So I think Mark has made the comment and maybe they'll do some adjusting on the uh, assistant coaches. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I guess what bothered me about the money was the fact that obviously they thought she was doing a halfway decent job because they extended her contract mm -hmm. three out did. of five years. Right. Yeah. That doesn't sound like you're ready to fire somebody. But yeah. she was – yeah. this is the thing that kind of sticks when in this conversation and nobody's made a big deal of it, but – she was in the top five pay-wise of the conference, not nationally, of the conference. If you want to be running a program on and be nationally competitive, you need to be looking for a coach that merits the dollars to pay them on a nationally competitive level, do, not yeah. being top five in the SEC, being top five in the nation. Yeah. 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 Well, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but ever, ever who comes in here is, going to go right back into a pressure cooker and sure i don't know whether you can ever t i don't think that ghost of pat head summit's ever going to be caught yeah. i think you're going to be chasing that ghost a long time because what she accomplished here was in a different era a different time things are different there's a lot more parity in winning women's basketball today than there was uh back when pat coached uh back in, in those days there was what stanford and connecticut and tennessee I think they pretty well dominated. And there may be another team that slipped in there from time to time, but not nearly the parity that they've got now, I think, yeah. in women's basketball. So, Hey, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, Tennessee and uh, the Elite Eight up there in uh, Detroit. Last Sunday, the Tennessee ball basketball season came to a close as the number one seeded uh, Purdue Boilermakers defeated uh, Rick Barnes' troops 72-66. to The game came down to the final five minutes. And Purdue really put the game away with a huge, uh, in my opinion, a three-point bucket and capitalizing at the free throw line. Tennessee finished the season with a 27-9 and record. Uh, Marcus, uh, I, I guess it was a, a game that uh, everybody left uh, pretty much feeling good about. I mean, for the most part, people thought, well, they really worked hard. I mean, they really put it all on the line. They really got right down to it. But they lost. I mean, but the taste in everybody's mouth was, I think, pretty good after a loss as well as it could have been, huh? 
Well, you know, Tennessee played well. So you couldn't – I mean, yeah. there were there were some things that you wished would have gone the other way and maybe a couple moments in hindsight where you wish they'd done something differently. But it wasn't like Tennessee went out there and did not play well. They played well, and they ran into something that nobody has found a good way to stop this year. And we're going to see how – if it's enough to carry Purdue to a national championship this year. But how do you stop Zach Eady? I mean – it makes you wonder how in the world these guys lost in the first round a year ago. Yeah. And we're up with that number one 16 upset. I mean, that with him on the court, I mean, with the way he played against UT, how do you stop that? Well, I think the game plan, uh, uh, Dwayne going in, I think it was a good game plan. It looked like, you know, they were pretty well set on, you know, Edie's probably going to get his points. We're going to try yeah. to hold him the best we can, but – you know, nobody else has all season long, so why should we think we're going to? But they, they went in and said, we're going to shut Purdue's guards down. We're going to shut them down. We talked about this last week. They went after Purdue's guards, and by golly, they did a really good job yeah, uh, on those perimeter people. And when he got right down to it, Zach Eady, he was the difference in the basketball game. He yeah. really was because it got into a, a defensive-type back-and-forth game, uh, and – you know, when you score 40 points, and if he had, had hit his free throws, he'd have scored 50 points. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's a lot of questions involved uh, with him. Uh, you know, there's three-second calls. The tent. You know, he's got you know, the tent down there. I heard they're renaming uh, – Smokey's are renaming Campsite 15 up there at Tremont <laughs> as the Zach Eady Memorial. There, there you and go. I, I, and I don't know how many steps he gets in there, but obviously more than the rule. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of questionable traveling violations that he had in there. And he doesn't ever foul. You know, he gets, no, no, he doesn't foul. He doesn't. Hard, he doesn't. I mean, <laughs> absolutely. And, and, but I think Rick Barnes kind of hit it on the head where he says, "Well, you know, he's a he's a hard guy to defense. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. And he probably is a really hard guy to officiate." Yeah, you know when you're trying to officiate in there. Yeah, because so, you got to yeah. look up and hurts the, hurts the officials' necks when they were looking up yeah. at him all the time. Yeah, but he was 13 for 21 from the field and 14 of 22 from the free throw line. But <laughs> Dwayne like the free throws shooting. they shot 30 some free throws. Tennessee shot 11. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that's, that's pretty much that's hard to overcome that deal right there. It right? is. Yeah, I just I couldn't understand why they weren't you know some more foul call. But anyway. Uh, a dude didn't play. I didn't think he played very well, to be honest with you. Because what? How many rebounds did he end up with in that game? Is it like two or three, two, not three many. or four? Or something like. Not many, and wow. not many points either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that was and then, got out rebounded forty-seven to twenty-six, so there wasn't anybody rebounding. And that was, a, yeah. I thought that was something. You know, we talked about. I didn't really think about it as the impact he would have on the rebounding game as far as how often UT gets those second-chance points and how much a part of their offense that was. Yeah. And he shut that down yeah, with his did. rebounding. There were, there were not a lot of those chances where Tennessee was tipping the ball back out to the guards for a second-chance no. shot. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, 10-point swing right there. Yeah. And then Adu, he didn't even play that much, did he? Actually, how many no, minutes I, did he play? I just like, don't think he was doing the job on Edie. It wasn't physical enough with him in there. No. But. And I thought Purdue was smart. They went to Edie. They thought, well, we, you know, we, we'll get their inside people in foul trouble, and, you know, that'll be to our advantage. And they did. Yeah, they did. They, they got, yeah. got them in. But if you, look at the, if you look at the game here, you know, Edie got his – he got uh, uh, his points, you know, his 40 points or so in the, in the ball game. Uh, Tennessee, Tennessee shot 38% from the field. Purdue shot 45%. Uh, Purdue went to the free throw line 33 times to 11. I think that's the uh, difference. I mean, I in mean the really, game. you're looking at the stats right there, and you go, you know, really, you know, we're kind of lucky we were just, you know, went down to where it went. Yeah. I mean, really. I think that's the difference in the game is how many free throws that they got, you know, and and Edie actually hit. I mean, he hit better than I thought he would at the free throw line. So he shot then, a lot better than his average. Yeah, he did at the foul line, and he shot a lot better than he did the first time against Tennessee at the foul line. But he well. takes his time with that free throw line. It seems like it's forever. Well, for you know, <laughs> you know, we were watching the game with friends, and, and, and uh, you know, there was comments made by you know he really shoots his free throw well. Well, when you go to the free throw line thirty times a game, you ought to be able <laughs> yeah. to shoot that way decent, shouldn't Should, you? Should, yeah, exactly. Huh? A lot uh, of practice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Donnie, uh, we've talked about the rebounding. We've talked about the uh, we talked about the shooting percentages and the free throw. But uh, uh, Tennessee didn't get any scoring off the bench. No. 
And and that's uh, unusual too because Tennessee usually comes in off the off the bench and and gets a great pretty pretty good contribution anyway. Uh, and that just didn't happen. No, no. no. And Marcus uh, uh, Zakai Ziegler uh, didn't have his game. Uh, and there's there's all kinds of rationalizations for that. You know, we've we've talked here and other people have talked about he's playing 40 minutes a game. When's it all going to catch up to him? Did it catch up? Did it catch up in the Purdue game that he didn't have the th- legs, didn't have the stamina? I don't think it was his legs, but I think his I think his groove depends on him being confident, and being able to do certain things, and it's not just being able to shoot the three, but also being able to penetrate and use that to spark UT's offense. He couldn't do that. He couldn't drive the lane. That's for certain. He could, like, yeah. And because if you think about it. Usually when he drives the lane, you have a rotating defense where you have somebody rotating over to come towards him mm-hmm. or coming at him from the backside that creates an opening. All he had was Edie camped out right in front of him. Yeah. There was nobody moving. There was no adjustment in the defense creating an opening for him there. And he couldn't put it up against him because even if no. he did, he, was, he wasn't getting the foul call. Absolutely. That was very obvious. There's so, one choice to kick it back out. So it, it kind of, I think that kind of threw him off his game and made him a little bit dependent on going, shooting from outside. And he's not as good when he feels like he has to shoot from outside. Yeah. Yeah. He shoots yeah. better when he, when, he can feel like, when he feels like he can choose which option he wants to take. Yeah. I thought this was an interesting stat. Uh, uh, we've talked about uh, Tennessee down the stretch of the year and in the tournament really relying on Dalton Connect, uh, Dwayne. Yeah. Uh, in this basketball game, uh, game uh, Connect took 31 shots, more shots than the rest of the team. The rest of the entire Tennessee team he took. Yeah. Didn't take 31. What did he end up with, 37, I think? Yeah, 37, 37 points. 37. He had 37, yeah. and I think Edie had 40 points. 40, yeah. Uh, so both of them, uh, you know, proved themselves <laughs> sure. in, in the basketball game. Yeah. But, you know, when you become one-dimensional, yeah. uh, you can get your – you can go so far with it and, and – Live by the sword and die by the sword. The last four or five minutes, uh, he had trouble. You know, yeah. getting shots to go down. He and by tired, golly, yeah. and by golly, they were good shots. Mid range shots. They were not. Yeah. They were not forces at all. <laughs> no. If you want anybody taking a shot, those were the kind of shots you'd want somebody to take, especially him. But exactly. they were. They weren't going down. The exactly. one with the three pointer from the wing with about two minutes to go, I think, was huge because it did. It looked like he thought it was going down, and it didn't. Yeah. And it was a good look. I don't. He didn't. He seemed rattled by that. Cause I think he, so too. Yeah. Uh, I I thought the play that really, really turned the tide. And this was a player for Purdue uh, that hadn't played a whole lot in the game. He buried that three when Purdue was up three right there in the last maybe three minutes, three and a half mm-hmm. minutes, and put them up six. Yeah. And then we went down and we didn't capitalize. And then that's when the free throw. Free throw. Yeah, that, was, yeah. that was that the was shot before. Oh, that was a killer, boy. That yeah. was the shot before, and Connect was trying to answer it. Yeah, when he, when he missed that, I and just, that was so, it was a good look. Yeah. You talk about Edie all you want, but that that kid burying that shot, that was That's a big shot. Oh man, that was. Yeah, yeah, that Very. was a fi- that was a final it, four shot. That was it was huge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was really surprised, uh, Marcus, that. Uh, Purdue didn't really do anything special against Connect. I mean, you know, there it wasn't like a Mississippi State deal where there were a lot of double ups mm. and that type of thing. There wasn't any boxing ones. There wasn't any triangle and twos. There was just they just tried to play him head, yeah, head up. Just play like, good defense. Just on. like you know, yeah. let's just you know, we know we we're, we're, he's going to get his points. Let's try to shut everybody else down. That's what they did, and yeah. that's exactly what they did. And he got thirty-seven points. Yeah, and they just let him go about his business. I was surprised. You they know, you, d- they did, but. You know, you took away two things from his game. He couldn't go inside with it. And Edie never left the floor, so it never created an opening for him to have a couple minutes where he could try to do something like that. And it was the same thing as with Ziegler. If all you do is give him the perimeter, it doesn't allow Tennessee's offense to operate very well because there are no kickouts, there's no kickbacks, there's no drives. Um, And I don't know if – Tennessee really challenged the referees to make that call enough to go in against him. If they gave him a little bit too much respect that he was going to stop them. I'm not sure if just going in and going for the contact and seeing what the refs do wouldn't have been a little more helpful at some point, but that's, you know, three days later looking at, looking at it multiple times. And I, and I think that what you're saying in essence is 
is Tennessee went to the foul line 11 times. And normally when Tennessee would get behind, like like they did in this game, like six points, mm -hmm. Barnes is going, take it to the hoop. Because we're going to take it to yeah. the hoop to where we draw fouls, stop the clock, go free throw line. But you got Edie in there? Yeah. You're not taking it to the hoop. No. And I think that's one of the reasons you shot 11 free throws and no more because you didn't have that advantage of taking that's, it in there like they normally would that's, have. That's huh? right. Hey. So, But if you look where he's camped out, like, if you don't have somebody drawing him up the lane, he camps out in that zone where it's not an offensive foul. So, I, that was a point. But, it was like I said, it wasn't something I noticed until I looked at the, watched the game a little bit more later on and watched it again. But he would have been – he was in that zone where they could have driven and the foul would automatically have to been on him if they, if they were going to blow the yeah. whistle. Donnie Moore, this has been a Tennessee team that could uh, put points on the board, could get up and down the court. Yep. Uh, but in this uh, basketball game, and, uh, you know, it just looked to me like, uh, or I would have thought with Connect and how we've played during the year that you'd want to you'd want to go up and down the court a little bit more and run Edie, get him tired a little That's bit. That's what you I know, was Up like, and down yeah. the court. But we didn't do that. We got right into a half-court game, and I'm thinking, well, you're doing just exactly what <laughs> Purdue would want you to do. You know, you're not – and he played, what, 39 minutes? Exactly. He, he was out one minute right. of the basketball game because you just played a half-court game. Up and down, I think they, that, uh, that they would have set him more. What do you think? I agree. I think the game was to, to Zach Eady's yeah. advantage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I, I, don't know why, I don't know why we didn't play uh, – well, I don't want to say smarter, but, but – Indeed, I guess it was smarter. Uh, Picking we, up that the we trend. didn't play, yeah. 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 Picking up yeah. the pace of the game. Yeah, it almost looked like um, we played all year up and down for the most part, and then there were other times in the tournament where we were right back to. Gosh, this looks like last year or the year before. Yeah. The way Barnes likes yeah. to play, just play defense and hope that that pulls you on through. You but know? I was thinking, like you said, I, I was thinking they's about either getting tired, so I thought they would try to. Get him tired running against yeah, him. Yeah, he's a big stuff. guy. Yeah. You would think. <laughs> you would think. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I thought Purdue, uh, Marcus, played it smart under the two-minute mark. They refused to, to, to challenge a UT on drives. When they got up, they pretty much just let them. They pretty much let them have the bucket. Mm -hmm. If they wanted the bucket, they'd let them take it. They didn't challenge. The only real challenge was on connect. Right there, and I thought that was a big play too, where he drove in there and Edie got the big block. Yeah, right that, there at the that end. was but one where it didn't matter anymore. No, it didn't so matter late. anymore. That's correct. But but uh, they, you're right; they didn't challenge them before that because when you're that's when you're playing with that six point cushion, you can do that. Yes, you can. Because as long as you hit your free throws, they're not going to put you in the position that where you're going where you're in. You know, hey, they can hit a game winner on us. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're still keeping it a, a two-possession game no matter what. So as long that was why that three was so huge that Purdue knocked down because oh. they played those last yeah. two minutes with that six-point lead. Yes. If he doesn't hit that oh. and it's a three-point lead, Tennessee can play the end much exactly. differently, and Purdue has to defend. Exactly. And, there, and yeah. there wasn't much talked about after the game about that kid hitting that shot. Yeah. But I'm telling you, that's a million-dollar shot that, that huge. kid hit. It was huge. <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah. it really was. Uh, I would have liked to see him run some of gimmick defense that we talked about. I would like to see him play five guards and put Ziegler on Edie and yeah. see how he responded, <laughs> even if it was only for a possession or two. Yeah. Well, I thought it started out. I thought, you know, they've got a pretty good game plan because every time Edie got the ball in there, they, they collapsed on him. Yeah. You know, they had two, three guys right there collapsing, and it was working. You know, he's having trouble getting the ball from his uh, midsection on the body on up, and we were getting hands on the ball. And I thought, well, you know, this looks like they've got a pretty good plan right here. Yeah. And then, you know, it just all fell apart when, when Tennessee got in foul trouble for the most part. Yeah. And he yeah. hit some pretty good little hook shots, too, Edie did, whereas yeah. A.D. did not hit yeah. his. Well, know. we've talked a lot of reasons here why Tennessee <laughs> uh, didn't make it on uh, to the Final Four, but let's get down, to Donnie, to nuts and bolts right here. Uh, is this just another curse of Rick Barnes? Is, is, is Rick Barnes cursed? The man has been in coaching for 38 years. He's a Hall of Fame coach. He's coached Kevin Durant, great players. He's had some really quality teams here at UT. And he's got one final four to show for it. Well, he's either cursed or he's just very, very, very patient. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> of course,
course, they've been playing basketball a long time here at Tennessee, Dwayne. Yes. And they haven't been to a Final Four yet. No, so I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the whole outfit's cursed. <laughs> I don't know. I was hoping so much if they got past uh, this game. Yeah, I, I thought too. we would, you know, we had a really good chance. It, yeah. You know, it is, but, man. Saying, you know, if you're in the lead eight, you know, that's a lot of progress from where we were at. So, yeah. well, if they can get some people, you know, in the maybe some portal – Guys coming in, you know, maybe have another good year That's next year. That's why I think that SEC regular season championship means so much because when you get that, you can say, well, we've got the SEC regular season champion because there's only one exactly. NCAA right. champion. There's the SEC regular season champion. They had the SEC player of the year and don't connect. SEC defensive player of the year in Zakai Ziegler. And now they can say, well, we went to the Elite Eight, you see. Yeah. We had our chance and went, went right down to the last three or four minutes. And we had a chance to win the game, but we didn't. So what I'm saying is the year is left, just how you guys are all leaving it right here, with a pretty good taste in our mouth. Yep. Yes. It was the loss that didn't taste so bad. And so Connect speak. brought a lot of attention to UT. You know, a lot of people have been talking about That's Connect. Right. So, you know, UT got a lot of uh, good out of that, too, I think. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, it's time to turn the page and announce the Anderson Lumber Company Player of the Week. You're listening to the Go Tee Sports page, and now stay tuned for the best in local sports. It's payday, and on payday, you want to have access to your money right away. When you enroll for direct deposit at Knoxville TVA Employees Credit Union, your money comes to you with no waiting. It's the fastest and most secure way to get paid. Getting set up is easy. All you need is your account number and our routing number. Find out more at tvacreditunion.com. Join us. Join us now. Federally insured by NCUA. Some restrictions apply. Ask for details. Since 1925, Anderson Lumber in Alcoa has proudly served and supported our local communities. But did you know Anderson Lumber is so much more than a lumber store? You can stop in anytime and see our incredible kitchen showroom. From floors to cabinets and everything in between, Anderson Lumber's experts can help you design your dream kitchen. And then our install team will make it a reality. Wow. For anything home, we welcome you to visit Anderson Lumber in Alcoa or shop over 67,000 items online at andersonlumbercompany.com. Anderson Lumber, since 1925. Aubrey's is known for real comfort, real food, real good. But remember, Aubrey's is also really into Blunt County. Aubrey's Maryville has been a strong supporter of local schools and sports programs for more than 15 years. From baseball to football, dance teams, and marching bands, Aubrey's has helped schools and youth programs generate thousands of dollars. It's easy for us to do because it's the right thing to do. So the next time you're looking to choose a place to eat, we hope you'll choose Aubrey's. Real comfort, real food, real good. See what's on the menu at aubreysrestaurants.com. Merlin's Music World in Maryville is owned and operated by Dylan Davis and has been a fixture in Maryville since 1987. Guitars, amplifiers, lessons, sound system, and video system installations are products available at Merlin's. Merlin's also offers a 24-track digital recording studio featuring audio engineer Rusty Chambers. Visit Merlin's at 1920 East Lamar Alexander Parkway or call 977-0093. We all want our loved ones to be safe. Denso and Maryville is at the forefront of creating technology for safer vehicles. Join the automotive industry with Denso in a fast, challenging, clean, and safe environment. They offer great benefits and competitive pay, as well as a convenient on-site health care facility, cafes, fitness center, and more. Start your future now. Entry-level production positions start at $16 an hour for second or third shift. Visit DenzoCareers.com slash Maryville to learn more and apply. Welcome back to the Goatee Sports page. And uh, Donnie Moore got a little ahead of myself here. Got all excited about the <laughs> Elite Eight. And uh, I was passing, going to pass over Mark It Down and uh, your uh, sports scores. Uh, segment, so we'll back up a little bit here <laughs> and get back on track. That's what excitement will do to you, I guess. That's okay, uh, buddy. We, yeah. we're, we're good at punting around yeah. here. So. I'll turn it over to you, guys. I appreciate that. Let's uh, begin with our local scoreboard sponsored by Mandy B Street Realty for this week. Show number 34 of the season. Wow. Are wow. we already on 34? We are on number wow. 34. Wow. 
Goodness. Wow. It seems like 20 was just yesterday. Rolling right mm -hmm. along, aren't we? Now, how many we do? 40. 40. My gosh, we only got about six more shows. Six more shows. Goodness. Rolling right along. Let's start off with a little bit of baseball. Don't have many to give you, but I got a few. Oh, I got an announcement before we get on to the Scott Do score. it, Marcus. Um, the East Tennessee Baseball Coaches Association tournament that's mm -hmm. going on, Heritage is the host site today. It got is. a text as we went on the air from Robbie Bennett that all the games at Heritage have been moved back one hour from the original tournament times. Okay. So if you're planning to go out and see Heritage and William Blunt play today, um, those games have all been pushed back one hour on the start time. Good deal. Thank you for that, that update, Marcus. All right. Uh, got Like I said, got, got two or three scores for you right here. Uh, yesterday, Maryville versus Oak Ridge. Uh, that was that was a close one, but Maryville came out on top eight to seven last night. Uh, don't have a score for you, but I do have. I was looking at uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, and uh, William Blunt lost to Catholic last night. Like I said, do not have a score on that one, but I do know that William Blunt lost to Catholic. And uh, I guess that was in that that was in the tournament. That tournament, right? Okay, in the uh, Panama City Beach Marlin Classic, are they down in, Ch in Panama City? Who? Seymour? I do not know. Well, they beat Marion County, Kentucky last night. Uh, that, that, according to uh, my source, they are in Panama City Beach. I, my, must I, be I really a nice place to you. play right now. I could not tell you if they're taking a break at this time of year or not. But, but they maybe beat they are. Uh, Marion County, Kentucky, six to three. Obviously, in the Panama City Beach Marlin Classic yesterday, and uh, Greenback and Kingston. Greenback only managed to score one run to Kingston six. So. We'll see what happens, Greenback. They they tend to come around late in the they season. They do. Mm -hmm. They usually are a little slow starters, but uh, uh, Kingston put up six against them yesterday. Softball scores. Uh, Lady T's of Alcoa roll, keep rolling in this they season. They are off to a fantastic start They this sure year. are. They won two yesterday in the Eastman Invitational. Uh, game number one, they, they beat Honaker, Virginia, in a shutout win, nine to nothing, and came back in the, in the in another game later on in the in the afternoon or evening and beat uh, Walker Valley, eleven to five. And that's on the heels of them winning over Gibbs midweek. Yeah. Um, that was Gibbs yeah. team they lost to earlier in the year. It was Wednesday, wasn't it? And they beat the, they beat them six to five mm -hmm. um, with a. Uh, I wouldn't call it a walk-off single, but it was an RB. It was a single to move the runner from first to second, and possibly to third. But there was an error in the play that eventually gets her home. I'm not sure exactly how they scored that at Alcoa, <laughs> but it was a very good win over a very good Gibbs team. Oh, Gibbs is always good. And they are they were actually playing at Heritage last night. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, got another score here of interest. Uh, Greenback. Uh, was victorious over Eagleton eight to three yesterday, and got several more games. No scores posted in softball. Uh, that'll do it for scores. We got some national letters of intent signed this week. A bunch of them. A bunch of them all over at Maryville. Thanks, well, that, Marcus. That, that's going to work into some, some some guests we got here coming up. That's right. We'll do that. We'll report the. Uh, NLIs that were signed this week. Emma Meyer uh, signed with Center College for swimming and diving. Uh, center's in Danville, Kentucky, a D3 school. So congratulations there. Cooper Leonard went uh, signed with Young Harris College. We've got some different schools here that, that, that we haven't, haven't mentioned before. Young Harris College, a D2 school for lacrosse. Uh, Young Harris College is a private Methodist affiliated college in Georgia, and they are the Mountain Lions. Yes, interesting. I like it. The Mountain Lions, and they got they got a good steal uh, for division uh, division two lacrosse. To, mm -hmm. I think maybe he was flying a little bit under the radar because we don't have an official lacrosse program in the state yet. Or, yeah, and it's I think they now. got a, I think they got a bit of a steal there. Good. 
Good. Congratulations. Aaliyah Kennedy um, signed with Tennessee Tech for track and field. So congratulations there. And she'll, she'll, she'll benefit that program. She will. She's a, she'll she's make a an immediate impact. Them. And, you know, I hope we can get her back on the show. We've had her on the last couple yes, of years. Have. And, you know, maybe we can – I'm crossing my fingers for them. I don't want to put any pressure on them. But they're two-time defending state champs in that 4 by 4 relay. Yeah. I really love to see them get to three because it is so unusual to see the same four runners in a relay three years in a row. Yes, it is. Um, another signee, uh, uh, Logan McGlamory, offensive lineman from Maryville, signed with Carson Newman. Um, too bad we can't have Tony here today to talk about that. Tony Iruli, uh, football, he's an offensive lineman. He plays it all. Any, play, he can play any position on the line. He played center this year. Um, told me he's willing to go up, gain 20 pounds, lose 10 pounds, whatever Carson Newman wants him to do to get, to get on the field. That's great. Um, said he was really in love with the off the offensive line philosophy, which is basically Hulk smash, mm -hmm. go forward. There's not a lot of retreating for past defense at Carson Newman. Awesome. So, awesome. it's a good fit for him. He will fit right in. Uh, Dom Shimino, am I pronouncing that correctly? I believe so. Close. Good. Not too bad. A pronunciation. Uh, going to Iowa Lakes Community College in Esterville, Iowa. Esterville, I like that. Uh, the, and they are the Lakers. The Lakers, great. Uh, he's he's uh, signed for, for a, a wrestling, grant and aid up there. Uh, that's a community college up there. I, I hope that's a great fit for Dom. Um, Iowa Lakes Community College, Esterville, Iowa, the Lakers. And Liam Bull signed a grant and aid uh, to go to uh, Montreat College, Montreat College in, in uh, Montreat, North Carolina. They're the Cavaliers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he's going on a soccer grant and aid. They're an NAIA school, um, private school uh, over there in Montreat, North Carolina. Congratulations to Liam. Um, you know, they, these are – I love the way these, these people seek out these, these places to go that, that are not run-of-the-mill schools. And, you know, there's a, a lot that goes in with recruiting, and mm -hmm. so much of it is being able to make the contact and, you know, pointing yourself out to some of these coaches because the downside of the Internet at digital age is there's such an abundance of information, it's easy to get lost yes. in that recruiting shuffle. And sometimes just that email to put yourself on their, in their mental – file cabinet of uh -huh. a possibility is such a great thing and most of the kids i have talked seniors i've talked to this year i would say more than half were the ones who initiated contact with the school and said hey i'm interested in coming there and that started the relationship for them and that's been such a big thing that's fabulous i love the way that, um, that works out and i'll even say uh and i just lost your name track I'm just talking about Aaliyah kennedy tennessee tech lost her email it got put in the spam folder. So they did not even know she was interested, and it only came out later when they found out secondhand that she was interested, and mm -hmm. they went back and found that she had sent them an email, and it was sitting in their spam folder. Goodness. And it started that whole thing with that kind of a laugh that, you, we're sorry we didn't, didn't don't know why you went to spam, but we'd love to have you. Yeah, that's great. And one more, Seth Mead, also from Maryville, uh, is uh, – committed to Guilford College. That's a, a Division three school in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Private school. ODAC school. Yeah. Tough and, uh, league yeah. for soccer. For soccer, yes. And uh, they are the Quakers. The Quakers. That, that's close to my heart because I went to Friendsville. And uh, Friendsville, of course, is known for, for their Quaker affiliation. And, you know, we still forgive you for that. Don't I appreciate that. We, we still that. let you on here every Saturday. I appreciate <laughs> that. But uh, congratulations to Seth and, and uh, all of these other fine athletes and students from Merrill High School on their, their uh, commitment and uh, continuation of their athletic and, and uh, academic careers in the future. Marcus, I'm going to flip it over to you. 
I consider and, it flipped. Uh, I, you're, I'll tell you, after I tell our listeners, you're listening to WKCE 92.5 FM and 1180 AM, Mid-Century Radio. Marcus, mark it down, my friend. Oh, thank you, Donnie. <coughs> we have well, special guests this morning. We do we, indeed. We have Maribel Tennyson in the house. Coach Chris Burns has brought his captains with him. And, Coach, thanks for joining us this morning. I know I gave you short notice last night, so I appreciate you all answering that late call and uh, agreeing to come We're in. thrilled to be here, so uh, thanks for having us on the show. Um, i I got to say, I've been, I've been reading the briefs in the paper, been looking at the record as you've been going along. Um, good start so far. Great start so far. Uh, I'm one thrilled. Loss? The boys have got one loss. Uh, they're 5-1. and one. And then our ladies are 6-0 and right now. I mean, I guess you could ask for more, but I don't know what you'd ask for from that. <laughs> I, I wish I had that win against Bearden back, you know. <laughs> you know losing to them 4-5 kind of stings a little bit. But, uh, I mean, we, you know, we had a couple matches in that, in that uh, Bearden match. It could have gone either way. And, 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 you know, it's tough to lose a match like that 4-5. Well, one thing I noticed about, I mean, you, you had a you had a duo that got to state last year in doubles, mm-hmm. but when I'm looking at the roster you sent earlier this year, it looks like a lot of underclassmen. It, it looks like you're playing we've, a lot of young, a lot of young players. We've got some youth this year, yes. So, what kind of challenge has that been for you? Um, these young kids have stepped up and uh, stepped in the lineup. Ephraim D uh, on the boys' side has done really well for us. He's undefeated. Uh, he's played at five a little bit. Now he's up at four after playing a challenge match and uh, playing really well for us. Um, Tanya Barwad, uh, she's uh, n- new to us. Uh, she's not a, uh, a rookie to some degree. She's, she's a junior, but she stepped in and played a, a great six spot for us this year. And now I get to put your captains on the spot a little bit, mm-hmm. but go ahead and introduce okay. to us uh, who you got here. To my left, uh, our Ladies captain, uh, Annie Milner, and to my right, uh, Josh Gideon for our boys. And you just don't hand out those captain titles to just anybody. What, what do they bring to the – what do they bring to each one of the teams this Both year? of these guys are, 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 and gals are seniors, and, and uh, just that senior leadership and uh, knowing what it takes to, to get our team uh, chemistry uh, headed in the right direction. So, which one do I get to pick on first? Your choice. My, okay. Your choice. You go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll pick on Josh first then because um, Coach has already mentioned it, but uh, outside of that one match with Bearden, everything has been going really well this season. What's been – what's gotten you off to such a good start this year? Um, I think that everybody's just clicking on their own level. Uh, everybody has their own partner, and uh, everybody takes care of themselves. So, it is a team effort, but uh, I think everybody's taking care of their own individual needs on the court, which is big for us. And um, we did lose one guy last year, but uh, for the most part, everybody else is the same. So we've all just had an extra year of growth. So I think that uh, last year was really just preparing us for the big season ahead this year. And you got, what, three seniors on the boys' team? Is that right? Uh, we have two this year. Two? Two seniors. So yeah. what's it like when you guys have been here and done that, but you've got a lot of sophomores, a lot of freshmen. Um, are they kind of looking to you as to how to not, – not how to play tennis, but how to play it in the high school style and the format you all play? Uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot of our guys have been um, – they've been in the mix, so they know what's expected. But um, they, def- they definitely look to us for guidance just to know um, what, what is expected at Maribel and um, what is expected of them as we uh, go off and on the court. So – this has been kind of a rivalry week for you guys. You've got wins over Alcoa and the one over William Blunt. And I'm going to guess I'm – it may shock people, but I'm going to guess the one over William Blunt may have been a little bit bigger for you guys. Is that true? Yeah, Much for bigger sure. for us. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, they had two really good guys in the past, and uh, after their passing, it's uh, they're a completely different team. But it was just nice for us to see that uh, in the victory column after that match. And how much rivalry does go into, like, in it with tennis because we know what we know what the rivalry looks like with football and basketball what is it on the tennis court is it as friendly and kind of rooting for them as long as you're not playing you or is it more kind of true rivalry style oh uh, yeah i um uh, i think it could go either way it just depends um i mean obviously there's a there's different parts where you're going to make different friends through tennis but as a whole 
you definitely want to see some of those programs fall. So it's nice when you get to see that. But uh, we're still mm -hmm. rooting for the guys in our district sometimes, you know. So, Annie, can, are you ready? I'm ready. ready you're, okay, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and start. Can you make the return? Of course. All right, okay. So tell me about the rivalry from the, from the girls' perspective, Yeah. especially with the win over William Blunt. Yeah, so we have a lot of friends on William Blunt because a lot of us play summer tennis with them. So it's really nice when we can win those matches and, you know. But um, one thing that I think our girls team is really good about is we're very friendly and I think we put a lot of, like, importance on um, building relationships and we're really supportive of each other. And I think that's why we've been so strong this year is because a lot of us are the same from last year. And so we just have really strong relationships. Well, the tennis season goes so quick. You've really got, like, three and a half, four weeks before you start playing into tournament formats. Is there pressure with being undefeated at this point? Or is For it sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we really want to win. We're doing a lot better than we have done in previous years. And so we definitely want to keep that going. So is it, is it more um, nerve-wracking when you've got a 4-4 a four, four, or a 3-3 three, three type of match going on then some of these things where you've, you've had 6-0 leads, is it a little more pressure? It's definitely a lot more pressure. I think it's stressful for anyone playing. But like I said, we all watch each other and we're cheering each other on, boys team included. I think we're all just kind of like supporting each other. Now, what's the for, for the people who haven't been out to watch a match yet? And shame on you if you haven't been out to see them That's play right. tennis. <laughs> um, Format-wise this year, is it doubles first, singles first? How, what's the format that's it, being used? It depends on where, where you're playing at in each school. For us, uh, we like to play doubles first just because we have five courts and our matches flow a lot more uh, steadily when we play doubles first. You're not having to wait around on, on, on a, a guy or gal to, to finish a singles match to go play doubles uh, from a time standpoint. So um, when, when we're at home, we like to play doubles first. But um, whenever we go on the road, there are times we play singles first. We, like we played Sessi this year. And and the, for us, stepping out from playing doubles first, and the, they're used to playing singles first, and it's we're playing at their house. And, you know, typically we just roll with whatever whatever we have to do with who's where we're at. Now, I'm, Coach, I'm looking ahead. You got another rivalry match coming up on Tuesday with Heritage. You got Harden. Weather permitting. Yes. Weather forecast looks good for Tuesday. Wednesday with Hardin Valley, not so much. Not so much, yeah. <laughs> um, but then the Hendersonville tournament's coming up. Hendersonville tournament's a that's, huge one for us. That's so. a big tournament for the – I mean, that's an elite tournament for the states, kind of like the one they host in golf. Yep. That it's a big deal. What do you – knowing what you've got right now, what do you try to get accomplished at Hendersonville? What do you try to get these – need to see these guys do down there it, it, it's a great measuring stick for us to see where we're at against other people across the state and it, it's what's fun about hendersonville um, us and william blunt are the two east tennessee teams that are there everyone else is like middle tennessee or west tennessee that that will be at hendersonville uh, still a team style format some of these invitationals that uh, other teams go to is more of a tournament style where you're having your ones play in, in a bracket who's playing a bracket but Hendersonville Invitational is so nice about this is that it's a team format and so we get to continue what we've been doing and and uh, we've got that confidence going into that after playing um, an early season start like this and getting a jump with a, a, a five and over excuse me a five and one record for the boys and six and oh record for the girls it's nice to be able to have that confidence going into this team style tournament so how many matches Typically, would you get to play at that event? We're guaranteed to play three, um, each team. And so after you've played your uh, pool format, then it goes into an elimination type thing. Now, I see both seniors are nodding with you as you go along here. Is this a tournament you all look forward to? Is this yes, a big, sure. like how, yeah. big, like how yeah. big a deal is this for you? Um, well, last year it was a little difficult. We didn't play, I think, as well as we could have. And so this year we want to come back, and I think we want to fix that. Um, also, it's just a really fun tournament. It's fun to watch other teams play because a lot of them are really good. So, Josh is a little bit different because you don't know as many of these players, and you're seeing them. You might see them once or twice a year, maybe three. Is it a little bit um, 
more fun because you don't know them? Yeah, um, I would definitely say it's uh, it's definitely different, and I, I do enjoy it. Um, there's there's kids that you'll see from all, all different types uh, out there, and um, there's some really good ones out there, but I think that uh, – like Annie said, we just we didn't perform to what we uh, we thought we could do last year. So I think uh, coming back this year, people uh, might have that narrative of us. But we're definitely we're definitely a contender this year, and we're ready to fight for it. How much of a measuring stick is it for you to kind of get a gauge of whether you can compete at state or not, and whether you can make that kind of postseason run? How much is that does this factor into that? Yeah, I think uh, I think this is big for us um, to come out with a winning record at Hendersonville would be huge for our team. Uh, there's a like Coach said, um, there's not many teams from our region, so um, it's nice to go play schools from out west or in the middle of Tennessee and uh, just gauge what we can do against different programs because there are a lot of good schools that compete at the Hendersonville Invitational. And you, uh, where, where's the point where you all start focusing solely on district and how you and getting a position for the postseason where does that happen is that next week or is it the week after or is it just wait until the tournament gets here um i think kind of like next week really we want to really get to our best level and play as well as we can and coach for people who don't know there's two different tournaments going on individual play and team play mm -hmm. when you get to that postseason how do how do those formats work because we found that nothing we thought we knew about the postseason in TWSAA is sure. the same as it once was. Sure, sure. So individually, um, we are allowed uh, two single spots and two double spots. So really six kids get to play. And basically everyone on our team has to make that decision whether we're playing singles or we're playing doubles. Um, and it's that kind of thing of, all right, what's the best path? W what we feel like that uh, – we can get someone to the state tournament. And we've been successful at that the last three years in getting someone to Murfreesboro. Uh, from a team standpoint, it's still, uh, from a district side, it's still uh, six singles, three doubles. But once you jump into the region play, it drops back to five singles and two doubles. And that's a rule I wish that TWSAA would look at and change that uh, to make it more 6-3 all the way through. Now Will ever is it a true tournament format for the teams? Like, do you all do the whole brackets, or is it like the top four or five? For our seats? district, it's uh, it's a two versus three. Uh, if you're the number one seed, you get a bye. You get to hang out and let those two teams battle it out for the right to play you. Um, and, and then once you get to that uh, district uh, championship, uh, they move on to the region, and then there's substate. Okay, so. We're to the market down segment. This is where I'm going to put the players on the spot here. And this is brought to you by Goatees, by the way, because this is our boss's um, suggestion list that I've taken some <laughs> pages from on his questions. So for, for the seniors, I'll start, with, I'll start with you, Josh. Who has the best grunt on the guys' team when they serve? Who is the, who is the one everybody hears? Um, I think – if I'm going to be honest, I'm going to have to give it to Tate Stokes. I think, Tate uh, Stokes for sure. I think <laughs> I think he really brings it out. And his isn't uh, – That's consensus. We, uh, some of us just like to do it for jokes. But I think his is actually real sometimes, and he doesn't even realize it. So, <laughs> I would give it to him. <laughs> Annie, what about for the girls? Is there is there a, a lead grunter on the serves? I'm going to say Perrin Stidham. Yeah, she she's really funny, but um, – you're going to get scared of her if she grunts at you. <laughs> okay, so I'm coming right back at you again. Is there a TikTok queen on, on the Lady Rebels? Is there somebody probably, who's going to be the one everybody goes to? Probably Lexi Mizak. I think she's probably the best with TikTok. I don't have it, so. <laughs> <laughs> what about for the guys? Is there, um, is there a TikTok king? I mean, nobody's big into it, but. And not being selfish, but I'm gonna say myself. I feel like <laughs> I feel like I'm definitely the one that's most outgoing for that. So I would say myself probably. Okay. So on a true tennis question, nice. who has the best surprise lob? Who's the best at making that change up shot and lobbing it? Um unintentionally I would say Jackson Sharp, but <laughs> I would unintentionally, I, I like would, that. But uh I would probably give it to Spencer Christian. I mean he's a uh, He's a very solid player, and he knows what uh, went shots to hit at the right time. So I would definitely say him. And the same thing. Who, who does the best at surprising people with that? 
I mixing think, it a lot. I think that's probably me. I, you. I like to hit those shots because people usually aren't expecting them in, like, higher seeds. And when the wind's, like, bad, I can push them back, and sometimes they can't hit it. So, Coach, <coughs> how, how much are you a fan of the surprise lob? I love the surprise lob. <laughs> okay. I mean, especially if you can hit that, that little drop shot, bring them into the net, and then loop it over their head. And that's fun to watch our players do that. And we have a couple players that are successful at doing that, and it, it, it's cool to see. Well, we appreciate you coming in this morning. Again, thank you with the late notice for getting up and agreeing to come meet with us. We're thrilled to be here. And Thanks uh, for having yeah. us. We wish you all the best of luck this week and beyond. You know, go win at Hendersonville. Got big matches ahead of us. So and, it's, uh, it's like, I, like I have told several teams this year to good result, You can al- we always love having state champions come back on the show. So if you can win your way into the state tournament, we'd love to have you back again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'll that's see a what challenge. we can do. That is, that is a challenge. Yes. Um, but anyway, get, thanks for getting up and coming to meet us this morning. And Donnie, I guess, or Mike, rather, we'll go ahead and turn the page. Okay, it's time to turn the page and announce the Anderson Lumber Company Player of the Week. You're listening to the Go T Sports page. And now stay tuned for the best in local sports. The Blue Tick Tavern is home to the tastiest pizza in Blunt County. Try our signature Broadway barbecue pizza, grilled chicken, and red onions covered in mounds of mozzarella. Or sink your teeth into our one-of-a-kind chicken and bacon pizza made with an olive oil base, grilled chicken, bacon, red onions, and covered in Brussels petals. The Blue Tick Tavern also has salads, sandwiches, and the area's largest beer selection. Regularly recognized as the best pizza in Blunt County, it's the Blue Tick Tavern located at 128 West Broadway in downtown Maryville. The Roger L. Newman Company began in 1984 with a vision of providing Blunt County with excellent heating and cooling service. Mr. Newman also wanted a real business. No gimmicks and no high pressure sales. They just fix it or replace it. They want to stay within your budget and make you comfortable. Their motto still stands true today. Call us first, we'll be there. Call Roger L. Newman Company at 982-5446 or visit online at rogerlnewman.com. Cooler temperatures are approaching. Upgrade your furnace now for as little as $50 a month. Your newspaper, that's right. The Daily Times is your newspaper, tailored to where you live, emphasizing the things that affect you and keeping track of the people and players in our community. The award-winning Daily Times can be delivered each morning right to your door or inbox with the latest in local news and sports. For a 30-day free trial offer, call 981-1100 and begin enjoying your life, your times, every day with the Daily Times. For over 50 years and three generations, the people of Blunt County have trusted Stevenson Tire with their vehicles and their families. Our mission has always been simple, to provide quality products at reasonable prices with exceptional customer service. Featuring tire products from Michelin, BF Goodrich, Uniroyal, Bridgestone, Firestone, and Yokohama, Stevenson Tire also offers alignment and brake services at affordable prices. Stevenson Tire Company, 2411 East Broadway Avenue in Maribel. Call 983-1621 or online at stevensontire.net. Waters Equipment is your East Tennessee New Holland agriculture and construction dealer. Waters Equipment has been serving Blunt County for 48 years and has two locations in Maryville for sales and service for New Holland equipment. Offering shop and field service for trucks and equipment of all brands, Waters offers equipment rentals for New Holland skid steer, mini X, and tractors. Call 238-9000 for your rental needs. That's 238-9000. Waters Equipment New Holland, excellence in service. Welcome back to the Blue Tick Tavern in downtown Maribel. This is Mike Edwards along with the rest of our broadcast crew. And now it's time for the Go Tees Sports Page Player of the Week segment featuring Daily Time senior reporter Marcus Fitzsimmons sponsored by Anderson Lumber Company where quality service is always a priority. Proudly serving Blunt County for over 75 years. And Marcus, uh, you got uh, William Blunt, Lady Gov softball team in here this morning and uh, they're off to a pretty good start mm-hmm. in the district. They're off to a really good start. Yep. And um, I, I talked with Coach Leatherwood and said, can you give me some players this week? She said, let me send you three seniors. And I said, I'm not sure we're ready for that. <laughs> I really don't know if we're ready for that. But well, you got the veterans in here. So yeah. 
I'm going to put them on the spot this morning, and they told me they're ready for that. So generally what we have, we always go to coach and say, introduce your players. But since we don't have Coach Leatherwood here, I'm going to pick on you all and let you introduce each other. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start with Destiny. Yep, you, yep, get, get the wild look. Who is Tate? Who, who is she and what, is, what part of the team is she? Um, she's our one of our big voices, always, always up, and she's flexible. She goes where she needs to, and she doesn't complain, so it's a <laughs> – Really strong suit for her. And Tate, introduce Savvy. Um, Savvy's our outfield leader. She's center fielder, but she can go anywhere when coach needs her to. And she is ready to do so. She always has a smile on her face and is ready to play the game. So you know which one's coming for you. <laughs> introduce Destiny for us. Um, Destiny plays first base for us, and she's always like, she's always there to pick you up. She always takes the younger players under her wing and. Just a good motivator. So I'm going to say thank you all for the introductions, but <laughs> and thank you for coming in this morning because when I look through the schedule, you all have been busy all week long. Um, so I've got to ask: Is it final? Is it nice to be finally comfortable in a t-shirt and not shivering <laughs> yeah. and yes. wet <laughs> and cold? It is. Um, and that's what I want to start with. Softball's. Uh, it's supposed to be a warm summer sport. <laughs> what, what does it do to you? What does it do to you guys when you have to play when it's forty degrees and rainy? Is what what adjustments does that require from you? Um, well, mostly we have to get over it and understand that the other team is in the same condition we are, and we still have to play the game, and we have to huddle up in the dugout, warm up our hands, and play ball. <laughs> is it savvy? Is it worse to ha is it worse to be on the field when the wind is blowing that cold, or is in the dugout not able to move as much? On the field. On the field. Yeah. Okay. So, is there a is there a secret trick to staying warm? Is like Coach Leatherwood have hand warmers? Is somebody got a big blanket? I mean. Sometimes Coach Kid brings a heater. <laughs> okay, so there is, there are tricks to this. <laughs> I, I wondered what was going on. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> um. So you've got, <coughs> we'll call it, um, I, I call it a busy week. But it was a week for the pitchers. Then um, a lot of close games. And so I guess, how did, how did you all feel about this week? Like at this point, looking back over the last week, do you feel like you won this week? Or you feel like there's still some things you want to do going forward in the next week from what you learned? I would say I think that we did pretty good. We definitely have to get our bats going more. But our defense has stood behind our pitchers, and we've made some good, good plays behind our pitchers. Destiny, what does it feel like when you all are having these pitchers' duels types of things going on? Is that how much does that help or hurt when you the offense when you're watching your pitcher work and the other pitchers working? How, how does that kind of play into the mindset of what y'all can do? I think it pumps us up a little bit and it gets us going more, and we're not as nervous. So. So if you have to if you have to pick one moment this week that we, you would say this is where we had this was one of our best moments, you know which one that would be. Um, last night, Destiny hit a line drive over the fence against Grace, and um, like it just showed our grit on the field that we wanted to continue to play. Like they were up by one, and she went up there and busted the ball. So we. We tied up the game, and we were ready to play after that. She woke us all up. She started it. So I'm going to pick on you a little bit here because not only have you been having a good season so far, but Donnie was mentioning you last week um, for signing. Yes. So talk a little bit about that. Um, you signed with Maryville College. Talk a little about making that decision, and we were talking actually with Maryville on a little while ago about the signings over there. Talk a little bit about how you kind of got in contact with Maribel, they got in contact with you, and how that went. Um, so over the summer, I decided, like, I was ready to play ball, move on to the next level, and Maribel had just gotten a new coach the year before, and I have always wanted to stay home during college. And so I went, I reached out, and she told me to come to a camp, and from that moment on, I fell in love with her. 
and the environment there and the girls. It felt like a family, and it just felt best fitted for me. I had visited other places, but at the end of the day, I felt a genuine connection with the girls that I'm going there with and the girls that I will be there with. So, Are you glad to have that out of the way? Yes, it was <laughs> stressful. <laughs> so stressful. <laughs> okay, so... Um, you all weren't you all weren't on the air for the last segment, so we're sponsored by Goatees, and our our boss over there um, has always suggest questions that we can ask that aren't necessarily of the entirely sports nature. Is that the best way to say I it? I would. Yeah, that'd okay. be, that's fair. That's so fair. We're gonna put so you, get ready. We're gonna put <laughs> they're you coming. On, we're gonna put you on the spot. I warned you there were gonna be tough <laughs> questions here. So we're gonna start off with. You know, let's, do a random pick. So we'll start off with Destiny. If there is a queen of TikTok on the team, who is that? Who is the person that has the social media? Definitely Abby McCauley. <laughs> <laughs> Getting some nods over here. That yeah. must be the right which, which pick. One is she, which one do you use? Is it TikTok? Is it Instagram? What, do you, what is she? All of it. All of it? <laughs> yep. She all knows of it, it all? Yep. <laughs> so she's always on the phone? Like, do you all no. take it away from her? or? <laughs> Maybe here and there, but it's <laughs> not the <nothing> major. <laughs> okay. Um, Savvy, who has the best nickname on the team? We have so many nicknames. <laughs> it's hard to choose? It is hard to choose. So this should, should this be a three-way poll to find out? Yeah, I think so. We have a lot of nicknames. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of nicknames. <laughs> what do we call Kat? We give Kat Katniss, our freshman a hard time. Katniss, 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 Catherine. Like, we give her a hard time. She has Katniss. all the nicknames. <laughs> all the nicknames. That's you, a good one. You got a nickname for Coach Leatherwood? Uh oh. Um, no. Not nope. that they can tell it over the air. Not that they can tell it over the air. Okay. Um, let's see. So here's one that's actually sports related. Is it weird not having Heritage in your district this year? Yes. Is that, does, that, does that kind of bust it up some rivalry and some things that you all used to usually do? Yes, but Maryville has very much taken that rivalry role, and we're ready for it. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's, the, that's the one that we look forward to every single year. And Heritage, we know it's going to be a tough game, but they're not in our district anymore. So So it's, it's literally just pride with Heritage. Yeah. Right? yeah. Because, yeah. you know, sure. it is, they are the, well, one of the other two county schools, yeah, I guess, right. at this point with softball. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look ahead at the big week coming up, are you feeling good about what's coming down the pike? Because I'm looking at it and I'm seeing Bearden on Tuesday, Farragut on Thursday, and then the Gibbs Invitational. Mm -hmm. I definitely think yesterday helped us to kind of, we had two tough losses last week. And um, not by a lot. Like, we didn't get run rolled or anything. We had a good run. I think yesterday really helped us to get momentum momentum pushing into next week. And are, are any of those circled games where you feel like you need to show something against any of those teams in particular as far as putting marks ready for the district tournament when it comes along? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I feel like we all felt stressed playing Maribel. Like, we wanted it so bad mm -hmm. that we almost overdid ourselves. But at the same time, the way that – and that was a very close game. It was a mm -hmm. pitcher's duel, 4-2. Did you feel like you, there were some things you learned about Maribel that are going to help you the next time you see them? Definitely. I think yeah. so, yeah. 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 And then the big question we've been saving here. <coughs> we understand, and maybe you all can help us fill us in on this. We, 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 there's rumor going around that the athletic director, Mr. Scott Cub, <laughs> is interested in challenging the team. Well, it's not a, a rumor. It, it, no. it is it's not a rumor. It's it's a rumor. A it's so do you all know any details about what this is supposed to be? Is, is yes. he supposed to be he supposed to strike him out? Is he supposed to see how, what he can hit? Um, Katie's supposed to pitch to him, and we're going to have a full defense out. And he has a runner. Um, his son, he gets his three son outs. Is gonna run. He gets three outs, mm -hmm. and I think they're gonna do like ten pitches, or maybe three at bats. It's one of the two, and he has to, if he gets on and scores, scores then we get a, like a bat taken. We have to get three outs. He's gonna buy us bats. 
team, team bats. bats. I got a suggestion for that first pitch. <laughs> Hit him right in the back. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'll, that'll throw him off. He has been a big air balloon in his head right now. Yeah. He thinks he's got it in the bag. He does. I, I believe he has – and, again, this, I, this is only rumor because, you know, anything on, you hear on Facebook is not actually legit. But the rumor was that he seems to be, you know, pulling back on some things the last time he tried this. Well, he's been posting videos <laughs> but I, I of the last time. This I just video. feel like, um, you know, I, I respect Scott. Because he went a, yard last time. He's our reigning athletic happened. director of the year, and, you know, he's done these sort of things before. Uh-huh. But he's also a bit older than the last time he did <laughs> uh, this. Yeah. And Katie's you know. good, too. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's going to be a perfect case for workman's comp. <laughs> You know, We've after been this playing is softball for since we were five, and we still struggle to hit off Katie sometimes. So he he's got to do some work before he gets <laughs> out there for sure. Well, I, I like the idea of this challenge. I I mean, if hey. if we were given the opportunity, I think we would broadcast live from. And that it's challenge. on Eclipse Day. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> now wait a minute. On, it's not going to happen during the eclipse, is it? No, no. It's going to be cloudy, so it's not going to make a bit of difference. I was going to say the throwing, weather forecast is not throwing good. to him in throwing to him in the dark isn't going to be exactly fair if that's what he's got in mind because that's for setting you up to cheat. <laughs> <coughs> well, and you y'all brought it up. So Katie's performance so far this year has been really remarkable. How much confidence does that give you when you take the field, knowing when you have her in the circle, knowing what kind of performance you're going to get out of her? How much confidence does that give you in the field? A lot, because we know we can rely on her, but we're also there to back her up. So, so it's not like you can just sit down and be like, "Okay, go to work." I'm I'm comfortable here in the grass. Yeah, <laughs> there are some games that we could totally do that. <laughs> 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 there are games that we can do that. Well, I'm just gonna say I, I appreciate y'all coming this morning, because. Um, I can't think of any other thing seniors would rather do on a Saturday morning than come talk to us, but <laughs> maybe there was. Um, so we appreciate y'all coming in this morning, and we wish you the best of luck, especially going into this week, because you know, make this a three-win week, and you're you're really in business for the for the postseason. So again, thanks for coming in. We wish y'all the best of luck down yep. the road. But Mike, I think we'll go ahead and turn the page. Okay, it's time for a break. When we return, it's the Boyd Sports Spotlight. As Goatee Sports Page veteran Donnie Moore will be up. You're listening to the Goatee Sports Page, and now stay tuned for the best in local sports. Aubrey's is known for real comfort, real food, real good. But remember, Aubrey's is also really into Blunt County. Aubrey's Maryville has been a strong supporter of local schools and sports programs for more than 15 years. From baseball to football, dance teams, and marching bands, Aubrey's has helped schools and youth programs generate thousands of dollars. It's easy for us to do because it's the right thing to do. So the next time you're looking to choose a place to eat, we hope you'll choose Aubrey's. Real comfort, real food, real good. See what's on the menu at Aubrey'sRestaurants.com. We all want our loved ones to be safe. Denzo and Maryville is at the forefront of creating technology for safer vehicles. Join the automotive industry with Denzo in a fast, challenging, clean, and safe environment. They offer great benefits and competitive pay, as well as a convenient on-site health care facility, cafes, fitness center, and more. Start your future now. Entry-level production positions start at $16 an hour for second or third shift. Visit DenzoCareers.com slash Maryville to learn more and apply. Merlin's Music World in Maryville is owned and operated by Dylan Davis and has been a fixture in Maryville since 1987. Guitars, amplifiers, lessons, sound system and video system installations are products available at Merlin's. Merlin's also offers a 24-track digital recording studio featuring audio engineer Rusty Chambers. Visit Merlin's at 1920 East Lamar Alexander Parkway or call 977-0093. It's payday, and on payday, you want to have access to your money right away. When you enroll for direct deposit at Knoxville TVA Employees Credit Union, your money comes to you with no waiting. It's the fastest and most secure way to get paid. Getting set up is easy. All you need is your account number and our routing number. Find out more at tvacreditunion.com. Join us. Join us now. 
Federally insured by NCUA. Some restrictions apply. Ask for details. Since 1925, Anderson Lumber in Alcoa has proudly served and supported our local communities. But did you know Anderson Lumber is so much more than a lumber store? You can stop in anytime and see our incredible kitchen showroom. From floors to cabinets and everything in between, Anderson Lumber's experts can help you design your dream kitchen. And then our install team will make it a reality. Wow. For anything home, we welcome you to visit Anderson Lumber in Alcoa or shop over 67,000 items online at andersonlumbercompany.com. Anderson Lumber, since 1925. Tick Tavern in downtown Maryville. This is Mike Edwards, and it's time for the Boyd's uh, Sports Spotlight. And uh, first up will be uh, sports page uh, veteran uh, Donnie Moore and yeah, of course, he's the Blunt County Sports Hall of Famer. And, Donnie, uh, we're going to wrap up uh, NCAA college basketball with the championships this weekend. And next week we're going we're gonna to move on down to Augusta huh, for the Masters Golf Tournament, with the, wow. sec the second leg of the big spring sporting event, so to speak. That's right. So uh, it's been an exciting tournament, uh, but there's other sporting news that's going on. So I'll turn, in, turn it over to you. Gonna put it to bed. Put basketball to bed here, aren't we? Yeah. Boy, yeah, I boy, tell you, it's a long haul. It sure <laughs> is. But you know, we're almost to the middle of April. We yes, we are. <laughs> we are. Well, it's uh, it's time for uh, our segment that we call our weekly sports headlines. Is that what we call it? We do call it okay. that. And you know who it's brought to you by? No, who? Fast signs. <laughs> That was, that was the signs going by really fast in the wind. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and it has been windy the last few days, too, hasn't it? Yeah. So if you need new signage, check in with Fast check Signs. In if with yours fast blew signs. away this week. That's right. <laughs> if your signs blew away or if you need new signs, go to Fast Signs. Yeah. We've been pretty much windy the whole show, haven't yes, we? Yes, we have. Huh? Uh, we, Not we're, here. We're good at <laughs> <No>. that. <laughs> well, guys, it's official. The A's are leaving Oakland after 2024. The club's lease with the city of Oakland expires at the end of this season, and they have rejected an offer of a five-year extension on the lease of Oakland Coliseum. The Athletics will play their home games for the 2025 through 2027 seasons at Sutter Health Park in Sacramento, California. Home of a AAA team. That's a triple-A part. With an option for a fourth season there. Hopefully, by 2028, their brand spanking new stadium in Las Vegas will be ready for play. The Las Vegas A's. It'll have to grow on me. Yeah. Well, Don't you see that come, turning into the Aces at some point? I, uh, yeah, they kind of do. Yeah. And Well, their fans have already left them. Yeah, well, they have. That was obvious. Did you see? Did you see the opening <laughs> day? About nobody at the game. There was maybe day. three thousand people in that ballpark. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, there. Well, this has been the worst managed ex exit from a stadium that I've ever seen. Yeah, mm -hmm. they. They. I think the uh, that stadium for years carried the nickname the Tomb. The Tomb. The Tomb, because of just the way it was constructed. I yeah. A lot of concrete. So well. It's really the tomb now because their their fan base is dead. Their and fan they've, base, and yeah. they've gotten off to a horrible start. So yeah. This is worse than the Raiders, improve. though. I mean, yeah. yeah, this has been so drawn out and so openly <clears throat> run through the ringer. Really, really mismanaged. You've totally you've totally lost your fan base. Yeah, nobody's coming to see you where you are. You're going you're going to a AAA park that's halfway to your new home. Not, I mean, a little bit a little bit less than halfway, but. Yeah. You know, you're not going to have you're not going to have any fans there. It's a hundred miles away from where you were playing, so I don't know what you do for ticket revenue for the next four years. But you've got to think it. Somebody's got to be sitting there taking the bullet for this, thinking, you know, as a team, as a franchise, how do we survive? Right. And by the way, while they're in Sacramento, the A's intend to be known simply as the Athletics or the A's, and not. The Sacramento A's. I wouldn't do that either. No. So there. Unless you want, to, unless you want a temporary merch bump, but no. Yeah. Now they're not. They're not going to be known as the Sacramento A's or the California A's or 
whatever. They just, just they're not, they're known to be so, simply by their, by their nickname. So Oakland has lost the Raiders and they've lost the A's. Yeah. And, you know, and, and what a, what a, a great tradition they had out there at one time. Can they you did. Think of the Oakland A's back in what is it, the seventies? Yeah. They had a, had Catfish Hunter and Reggie. Yeah, Reggie was out there. Joe Rudy. <clears throat> oh man, they had some, Raleigh Fingers. Raleigh Fingers. I mean, you know. Yeah. <laughs> had that I mean, stash. I mean, you know, in a way, it's it's sad. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Well, the NBA fined the Philadelphia 76ers one hundred thousand dollars yesterday for quote violating the league injury reporting rules. The 76ers, this is part of the quote, the 76ers failed to accurately disclose the game availability status of Joel Embiid prior to their game against the Oklahoma City Thunder on April the 2nd. End of quote. The NBA said that in a news release. This is a continuation of the quote. Embiid was listed as out in Philadelphia's initial injury report and subsequently played in the game. So, in the NBA, if you're listed as out, you'd best be out, apparently. Or you get fined $100,000. Yeah. (laughs) I'd say who cares. I know, yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Of the things, of the problems that the NBA has faced this year, this is what you really want to weigh in on. Off the yeah. I mean, I know. They've, I you, I can't imagine the difficulty they have trying to recruit to work in the NBA league office. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, it, it it cannot be sold as a good job. No, who wants to? <laughs> yeah, who wants to work there? Well, as the New York Yanks were taking batting practice yesterday morning around 10.20 a.m. in preparation for their home opener versus the Toronto Blue Jays, a 4.8 magnitude earthquake shook the area. 10.44 a.m., was it not? Uh, yeah, they, 10, I don't know, 10 something. The, the quake's epicenter, located nearby in uh, around Lebanon, New Jersey, didn't cause any damage but was certainly felt and heard. The Yanks simply went on with their scheduled batting practice. <laughs> we'll go with that. You know? <laughs> I mean, we've, see, we've seen World Series shaking up before, and thank goodness it was nothing like that. Yeah, really. Uh, 19-year-old Bronny James, who played basketball for Southern California this past season, will place his name in the NBA draft and enter the NCAA transfer portal while maintaining his collegiate eligibility. James, who played in 25 games this season, averaged a whopping 4.8 points, 2.8 rebounds, and 2.8 assists for the year. He shot 36.6% from the floor, including 26.7% from the three-point arc. Uh, not too great stats, was it? He he had really limited minutes. Well, he I mean, did. He, yeah. I think he averaged maybe like 17, 18 minutes a game. Right. And, you know, he was coming back from the cardiac arrest. Yeah, he was. He did. It he just, did. like, it felt like nothing ever clicked for him no. this season. And I don't know if that's him, the team, the medical situation. It could have been a combination of all. And you've, now you've got a coaching change going on on top of that. Just about to mention that. Trojans head coach Andy Enfield just left the team for the same job at SMU. And Southern California hired Arkansas head coach Eric Musselman at his, as his replacement. Most NBA scouts project James would be looked at in the second round of the draft. But it is also possible that he doesn't get selected at all giving him the option of signing with the team of his choice as an undrafted free agent. If he chooses to play college ball, basketball next season, it's possible that he could end up at the other schools that offered him a scholarship, namely Ohio State or Memphis or maybe another team. Well, it sounds like he's got plenty of options. Got plenty of options, doesn't he? He has <laughs> options, and 
I just kind of wonder if he's, you know, you're going to be weighing, because realistically he had, didn't have the kind of college season that's going to lead to you being drafted. No. So you're weighing what might I get as an undrafted free agent versus what can I get NIL-wise on yes. my potential. Yes. And, you know, that's what maybe, it that's, like. maybe some things open up. I mean, if, you're, if it goes to NIL and what's going on, does Al- has Alabama played their way into cont- contending for him? Yeah. Has Tennessee played their way into contending for him? I Could mean, be. It's, it's a matter of, you know, what he's interested in doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, you, you just don't know. Uh, here are a few on this day in sports items for April 6th, 1958, the 22nd Masters. Tournament in Augusta National at Augusta National Golf Course. Uh, Arnold Palmer wins the first of four Masters titles. 1958. 1973 was Roberto Clemente Day. The Pirates retire his number 21, his number and his jersey. Yeah, Great player, wasn't that he? That was after the uh, fatal play, the plane crash. Yeah. 1973. Uh-huh. Yeah. Also in 1973, the New York Yankees' Ron Blomberg becomes the first ever designated hitter in a game. You know what he did? You know what happened when he DH'd for the first time? He walked. First ever. 1979 on this day, April 6th, Orioles manager Earl Weaver. Boy, he was a he was a fiery manager, wasn't he? Earl Weaver. Well, he wasn't the calmest guy in the dugout. Oh no, he wasn't. You're right. He wins his 1000th game as skipper. It was a 5-3 win over the White Sox on that day. Colorful day. guy. Oh yeah, definitely. 1980 on this day, Gordy Howe completes a record 26th National Hockey League season. 1987, on this day, middleweight WBC championship bout. Sugar Ray Leonard upsets marvelous Marvin Hagler at Caesars Palace. Those are two good ones. Uh, Moving to 2020, the 149th British Open. Canceled for the first time since World War II due to COVID-19 pandemic. I'm glad those are in history footnotes now. Let me just say that. No kidding. Yeah, I'm glad that's over. And we hope that it never happens again. Hey, who got our plastic shields from COVID? Does Charlie Charlie take those with him to Atlanta? I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) Probably in the Blount County Dome. Are those items showing up on eBay yet? or? (laughs) I don't Anybody know. Anybody check that out? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. You, uh, wow. <laughs> Who would want them? <laughs> oh, boy. We got one birthday to, to celebrate on this day. 2000. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, 1969. Born on this day. Brett Boone, an infielder. Played for the Reds. Born in El Cajon, California. Brett Boone. Uh, deaths on this day. Got a couple to, to tell you about. 1953. Whirlaway, born. Whirlaway, yeah. Died on this day. An American thoroughbred. Yeah. Won the Triple Crown in 1941. Died at the age of 15 years old. Yeah. Whirlaway, yeah. good good thoroughbred. My dad. Uh, Great horse. When he got in a car, he got lost every time he was going somewhere in our family car. And we made a trip down here to Tennessee, and he got lost on the way down here. Now, I wasn't very old. I was probably eight, nine years old. Yeah. And he got lost on the way going back to Indiana. And my mother just jumped all, all over. <laughs> and we were on some back road in Kentucky, and there was this big sign. It said, Home of Whirlaway. Home of Whirlaway. And he looked at my mom, and he said, well, Louise, that's exactly my point. I want to take you all by the, by the, by the, by the home of Whirlaway, the, home of that won away, the Kentucky was. Derby, where he was bred there you go. and so forth. And he got out of that one, didn't you know, he? That's my family connection to Whirlaway. 
uh, death of in nineteen in, in two thousand twenty. Great baseball player died on this day, Al Kaline. Al, Detroit Tigers. Yes, sir. American Hall of Famer, Hall of Fame outfielder, 18-time All-Star. Uh, was a World Series star in 1968. 10-time Gold Glove Award for the Detroit Tigers. Died at the age of 85. Al Kaline. He was a good one. Well, that's all for this week's sports headlines brought to you by Fast Signs. Whoosh. Now let's bring the Boyd Sports Spotlight into sharp focus. Back to you, Gunner. Yeah, this is Mike Edwards, and I'm here with Donnie Moore and Marcus Fitzsimmons. Uh, uh, Wayne Easter uh, had to leave each, uh, early today, so uh, uh, we'll do the, the segment with our original crew here. Uh, before we get started, uh, you know, in years past, I've not watched many NIT uh, much of the NIT tournament, but this year I got interested for some reason or another. I, I did had too some, a little had bit. had some pretty good games. And, of course, the, the finals were held in Butler Fieldhouse there in Indianapolis. Yeah. And they packed it. They it sure was, did. It was nice to see that fieldhouse. Yes, at, sir. I don't know, 14,000 plus packed to the to the helm. That of course, field, it, field house came to life, yeah, didn't uh, it? historic. And, you know, they brought Bobby Plump in there and interviewed him, at uh, I think, uh, during the game. And, mm-hmm. you know, he was the guy that – Kind of the inspiration for uh, Jimmy Chitwood in the movie Hoosiers, and, right? Uh, so it was. Uh, they brought some some of the historical factors there about the field house, and I thought it was really well done. And they had Seton Hall and Indiana State playing in the final game. And, and Donnie, these were the two teams that they thought should have been in the NCAA tournament. Exactly. And I think they made a mistake on both of these teams personally because I think both of them were outstanding. I did too. Uh, Indiana State won 32 games. Uh, you know, counting what they did in the yeah, tournament. Yeah, that was a really good basketball but, team. But uh, I was impressed with both of the teams, and uh, I thought Indiana State uh, was well coached. Uh, they didn't make a lot of mistakes. No. To, you know, he shot the ball real well and had that uh, Robbie Avila. Yeah. Robbie Avila didn't look like a basketball player at all. No. But by golly, he could stand out there and hit the outside shot. Great. He sure could. Could handle the great passer. Yeah. Uh, he just looked like somebody that, that, that somebody might want to pick on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You know, just just uh, just didn't fit the mold. Had the the Buddy Holly dark rim yeah. glasses. It was and, a bully's dream, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but by golly, what a what a player he was. Uh, obviously worth uh, worth a watch. But uh, Seton Hall end up winning the NIT, mm-hmm. 79 to 77. Indiana State, I think uh, Marcus had a seven point lead with about two minutes to go, and somehow. Uh, uh, the uh, ball control and clock management broke down on them in the last couple of minutes, and they, they got beat there by two points. And Congratulations, then, Charlie Paleo. Yeah. Seton That's Hall. Charlie's school. Now Seton Hall went, uh, had to go all the way to Indiana to get a championship. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the uh, Sycamores lost their coach. Uh, he's moving on to uh, moving on to St. Louis. So, But anyway, uh, uh, I thought it was an outstanding tournament, well covered on television, and – Heck. It was. Uh, yeah. yeah. It was a good tournament. Yeah. Uh, hey, we, we talked a little bit about Kelly Harper and uh, and her uh, termination from the uh, Lady Vol basketball program. Marcus, who are they going to look? Who are they going to look to get? Is it, are they going to go back within the uh, former Lady Vol player, or are they going to go outside and get somebody entirely different? Danny, Danny White, what's he going to do on this uh, situation? Well, I wish, I wish we – I'm among that group that – Wishes we knew exactly what they were thinking, because um, I could see them going for another le- former Lady Vol, but at the very same time, I could see them just abandoning that completely and going out to get the best coach they possibly could. And those, you know, that's one of those things that happens on the concourse and in the suites at the Final Four. Is there's a, a lot of the coaches are there. There's a lot of hi, how you doing, and what are you thinking? And there's a lot of that, that networking that goes on that leads to some of these hiring decisions that get made and announced next week. That's true. <clears throat> um, but as to what circles UT is trying to circle in, I don't know. Um, I think if it was me and given the resources of the university and the fan expectation, I would go ahead and risk breaking with tradition and trying to – hire a big name coach and try to bring somebody in who gives you instant recognition because 
you don't have much left. You, you're going to have to get some transfers in because you don't have – You've lost your, your, your recruiting class. You've, you're graduating your best players. You don't have a whole lot star power-wise to work with to compete. So you're going to have to bring in somebody who can immediately get some transfer help. Yeah. How hard is that going to be, Donnie? I mean, you're going to have to get somebody with a pretty big name. I mean, th this is going to be a worse situation than either one of the previous uh, coaches that have been hired to take over this Lady Ball program as far as what they've got coming back. They, this is going to be the worst situation of – of any of the other two, they are. And, but you know what leads me to believe that they're going to they're going to really have to break the bank to do that is the fact that that uh, that Danny White did what he did in saving two million dollars right there in when, in the timing that he that he when he fired Kelly Kelly when but, he did. And this is the thing: if you're a coach, when you when you make that contract. And you're, you're. It's being negotiated. When you see that that date is set as when the payment drops, I mean, it's not like the NCAA tournament pops up randomly. You can right. look at a calendar and pretty much determine, okay, if they let me go, they're doing it the week before the NCAA tournament, so they can shop for a new coach. Yeah, you know that going in. Yeah, well, they right? only got, they and only you know you're going to take that pay cut, and if you don't want that risk, you ne you negotiate another date. Right. You put now, it in the summer. Whether or not they're willing to, to – by saving that $2 million, whether or not they're willing to turn that loose to spend on another coach, I don't know. But if, hey, but if, but, you've, got the, if you've already made the decision, it's not that hard to wait six days or five days or three days to get to that point where you get a cost savings. Whereas if it's in June, you're not going to wait three months. Right. So – that's a negotiation point, and that's a matter of the agent's negotiation with the school as to whether you get that or not. Well, if he decides to, to hire a former player, he's only got two choices, I, I, the way I see it. Carol Lawson. Carol Duke, Lawson's one of them. And Candace yeah. Parker. Yeah. Candace Parker. Those are the two choices. And uh, if you want a name, uh, in my opinion, it's Candace Parker. Of course, she doesn't have any coaching experience out there, and I don't know whether she's through with pro basketball or not, but – you know, no, you I'm might be sure able either. to. You be, and you, she's getting on up in age as far as her pro career. Uh, but you, she, I mean, she's you, launching a broadcast if, career right well, now. Yeah, but if you put enough money out there, maybe she, maybe she'd be interested. But those are the only two people. Uh, I think you would hit a, a bigger home run with Candace Parker than you would Carol Lawson. That's just my, that's just my opinion. I see. I, I like what Lawson has done with Duke and bringing them back to the stage because they were. We went through a, a, about five or six year span where they were a national power, and then kind of dropped back down. So I like she brought she brought them back on the stage, got them back to the Sweet Sixteen, mm -hmm. but and she's got you know a, a fan base following with that that video she did that went viral. But when you've got somebody like a Lawson or Candace Parker, the one it, it always strikes me like Magic Johnson when he tried to coach those type of players that were such good players don't always make the best coaches because they think everybody can perform at the level they played at. That's true. They're unknown entities, <coughs> basically. How about Wes Moore, North Carolina State? Is he possibility? That would be, I think, one of the better moves they could try for. Yep. Uh, I, I would tend to agree with that. Because he's got local ties. He's proved he's built success. I, I don't know if he'd be willing to leave NC State after all he's invested there. I think before we again talk as a group here next Saturday, I think they have a hire. I think they're going to have to move here pretty quick. Or I've, I've heard I expect maybe that to by happen. Monday. Yeah, I think it's... I expect the deal will be done I'm, over this weekend and we'll know bit, Monday or Tuesday. I'm yeah. a little bit surprised that someone wasn't on the hook, at least on the hook or uh, before you know, before you make this move, I mean, I, and that's a possibility because there are several choices within the conference that would sort of fit that criteria, and that's the sort of thing that could have been figured out during the SEC tournament, yeah, yeah. or at least preliminarily felt out in a what if situation. Yeah. Well, the NCAA men's uh, basketball championship continues today. Uh, you got North Carolina State and Purdue, and you got uh, UConn and Alabama. And Donnie, North Carolina and UConn, North Carolina State and UConn, men and women's team both in the Final Four. Right. That's pretty. That's it's that's happened, but it's a impressive. little. Yeah, that's impressive. 
Have we ever had well, two schools do it at the same time before? I don't know. I, there's been one. You know, Connecticut, I think, at times has been. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but I mean, like, where we've had two schools that have both had a team in each Final Four I'm at the exact sure same time. I'm not sure that's ever happened before. I, I can't remember that ever happened. I remember. Not in my memory. I can remember some years where we've had the same team in both, but not two of them. Mm-hmm. North Carolina, North Carolina State. Uh, you would have to say, uh, Donnie, that they would be the uh, Cinderella. They, team. They're definitely the Cinderella of yeah, this. I even expected them to. You know, they've they've played well. I'm, I'm telling you, they have played. To be a double-digit seed in this tournament, yeah. you you couldn't expect a team to play any <laughs> got, better than they you played. You got DJ. Horn, uh, their fine guard. Yeah. Uh, he, this is his third school. Sure. You know, he's Illinois State, Arizona, and now he's at North Carolina State. Took him, uh, you know, a little bit of traveling around to get to a Final Four, but he's here. I don't know who's checking his credits as far as his <laughs> academic. Well, who checks the academic credits on these guys that go to three or four schools? I don't know, but he he's there. And then they got the uh, DJ uh, Burns, they got the Burns in the kid paint. Too. Uh, doesn't look like a player, but he can play. He's a moose. And that's going to be interesting to see how he plays against uh, – Zach Eady. Just Eady, yeah. I think that's going to be one of the best matchups we'll see yeah, yeah, I, as to how they play against each other. I, he, I'm not, I, he can't push Eady around like he pushes all these other yeah. players around. And I'll though. tell you what, North Carolina State can't afford to get him in foul trouble. No. You know, you get him in foul trouble or you get uh, Horn in foul trouble, and, you know, that's going to – but more What's burns. He, 260? More burns. What's he weigh? Two sixty. Well, he, yeah, but it's more. Eady weighs three fifteen. But it's that it's that if with the similar size, it makes you don't see it very often in the game anymore. But when you've got somebody of a similar size, I wonder if they will referee Eady differently if it's a similar height. I don't believe he's a similar height. He's six nine. Eady's yeah. seven, seven four. I, four. I, I think there's only two ways you can handle Eady or uh, uh, Eady on the inside. <laughs> and that's to run him, like we talked about, or get him in foul trouble. Or you can clap, collapse everybody in there, but then you're you're giving the outside shot to, to produce guards and don't expect them to have – I don't think North Carolina State plays, Marcus, the defense Tennessee plays. So don't expect uh, produce guards to have the type of outing they had against Tennessee no, I, offensively. I, no, I, I think they've, they've, they're going to learn from what Tennessee did to them as well. Yeah. And UConn at Alabama, you know, UConn, good inside, good outside, strong defense, not a whole lot of weaknesses there. Better balanced and a better balanced team than Bama. Bama's going to look to outscore you. You know, they got Mark uh, Sears that's playing real well, but uh, I and think what is de- this? defense is going to be questionable for Alabama. I, I don't I, I don't see the tide is, beat what is UConn. It? I don't think but there's I mean, any way. Stranger things have happened, you know. This is Sears' um, fourth school in five years, is yeah. that right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's another transfer case that yeah. playing real well, playing, having yeah. a great tournament too. Yeah. But you, I think their big guy has been their key because he never, he did not play well in the regular season. I think Alabama's run up against a stone wall right here. Yeah, but you, I don't think they can. Uh, well, we'll we'll, we'll, t- we'll break that down when we have to. When you make me pick, I'll I'll tell you what I think. Yeah. There. But yep. UConn uh, looking to go back to back, and if they do that. Then next year they can look to go to back to back to back, <laughs> you know, with that program up there. But gosh, they just reloaded. They just reloaded this year. Hey, it's time for a break. When we return, it's the bowl prediction segment. You're listening to the Go T Sports page, and now stay tuned for the best in local sports. The Blue Tick Tavern is home to the tastiest pizza in Blunt County. Try our signature Broadway barbecue pizza grilled chicken and red onions covered in mounds of mozzarella or sink your teeth into our one-of-a-kind chicken and bacon pizza made with an olive oil base grilled chicken bacon red onions and covered in brussel petals the blue tick tavern also has salads sandwiches and the area's largest beer selection regularly recognized as the best pizza in blunt county it's the blue tick tavern located at 128 west broadway in downtown maryville Waters Equipment is your East Tennessee New Holland agriculture and construction dealer. Waters Equipment has been serving Blunt County for 48 years and has two locations in Maryville for sales and service for New Holland equipment. Offering shop and field service for trucks and equipment of all brands, Waters offers equipment rentals for New Holland skid steer, mini X, and tractors. Call 238-9000 for your rental needs. That's 238-9000. Waters Equipment New Holland, excellence in service. 
For over 50 years and three generations, the people of Blount County have trusted Stevenson Tire with their vehicles and their families. Our mission has always been simple, to provide quality products at reasonable prices with exceptional customer service. Featuring tire products from Michelin, BF Goodrich, Uniroyal, Bridgestone, Firestone, and Yokohama, Stevenson Tire also offers alignment and brake services at affordable prices. Stevenson Tire Company, 2411 East Broadway Avenue in Maribel. Call 983-1621 or online at stevensontire.net. Your newspaper, that's right. The Daily Times is your newspaper. Tailored to where you live, emphasizing the things that affect you and keeping track of the people and players in our community. The award-winning Daily Times can be delivered each morning right to your door or inbox with the latest in local news and sports. For a 30-day free trial offer, call 981-1100 and begin enjoying your life, your times, every day with the Daily Times. The Roger L. Newman Company began in 1984 with a vision of providing Blunt County with excellent heating and cooling service. Mr. Newman also wanted a real business. No gimmicks and no high-pressure sales. They just fix it or replace it. They want to stay within your budget and make you comfortable. Their motto still stands true today. Call us first, we'll be there. Call Roger L. Newman Company at 982-5446 or visit online at rogerlnewman.com. Cooler temperatures are approaching. Upgrade your furnace now for as little as $50 a month. Welcome back to the Blue Tick Tavern in downtown Maryville. This is Mike Edwards, and it's time for this week's uh, Bowl Prediction segment. And I'm here with Donnie Moore and uh, Marcus Fitzsimmons. And last night, uh, the women's uh, NCAA tournament, uh, South Carolina rolled uh, over uh, North Carolina State 78-59. to And, gosh, it really, after the half, it wasn't really in any doubt. Uh, it, it was, was close at the half. It was you're close thinking, at the half. And in man, second half, and uh, South Carolina just took care of it. I this. don't know what Don Staley said at halftime, but I hope they recorded it because it was <laughs> sure effective. Yeah. Yeah. Because they came out, they locked down defensively. They did. That third quarter. I don't think NC State got anything off with the clean look for the next eight minutes after halftime. You know, they got up. 15, 20 points, and Staley didn't lay off of them either. She she went after them. She challenged them and wanted them to, you know, to close out the deal and not but not, it, not have any let up. At and, all. But it was it was players off the bench that were knocking down the shots for them during the end of that run. I mean, you had like two or three people come off the bench and hit big shots and took that lead from 14 up to 20 something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this. Uh, you know, we're talking about Kelly Harper. You know. You know, her, her Lady Vols had South Carolina beat. I mean, you know, there was what, one second left, and uh, they hit the shot to, to, to win the game there. Yeah. But uh, my question is, if, uh, if the Lady Vols give South Carolina their only loss at this point, would it have saved Kelly Harper's job, you think? I don't know because we don't know the criteria. All that went that, into it. That went into the decision. Um, that re- the information the university gave us that she had been relieved of her duties did not specify anything as to oh. what the reasoning was. It was a thank you, we're moving on in a different direction, but it didn't say, no, it didn't lay down criteria as to what they were expecting that they didn't get. Yeah, you just have to assume she didn't win enough big games, didn't advance far in the tournament, but gosh, she went about as far as Rick Barnes is gone. You know, he's, he's been beat outside of this year in the Sweet 16 or before, you know, most of the time. So That's a different expectation level with that program. Yeah, and yeah it, it definitely you, is. And the more you're around that program and the more you speak with some of those donors, you're going to get a greater sense of those Lady Vol feelings yeah. and what their expectation yeah. is. Well, Iowa uh, beat Connecticut last night 71-69 to on, on Donnie, kind of a controversial call. Uh, oh, Connecticut yeah. had a chance to tie the game or maybe win the game in the last nine seconds, but they had a they had a moving block on a screen for uh, Beckers trying to get her the last shot, and they didn't even get a shot off. And gut call, I'll have to say it was a gut call based on what I, whatever uh, what I saw how that game was called. It looked like they let them play for the most part, but how big a call was that? Well, it's it, 
it was big. I mean, depending yeah. on your viewpoint, uh, if you're a, if you're a strict, if you look at it in the strictest sense of the of the of, the, of your view, it, it was, you know, a, a, a foul is a foul. Uh, yeah. But if not, you know, some people say you can't make that call at, at that point in the game. De- depending on how you've let them play in the in the rest of the game, we've, but we've seen a lot of games through the years, a lot of big games that officials don't like to make those calls. They don't want to be the that, one that's, that's to decide true. the game, and that only left about three seconds on the clock, and that was that was pretty much it. That's that's but true. The thing the thing was so who knows? <clears throat> you know, no referee wants to make the, a game altering whistle like that, but at the same time, when you look at that play. Don't look guilty as hell when you do it. Yeah. Exactly. Don't, they, they literally dared the official to blow the whistle because it is – you can tell the look on her face. She is trying to get an elbow out there. She is trying – and I understand it because it's part of the game, but don't look guilty as you do it. Yeah. This is true. Caitlin Clark was on the free throw line and hit the first free throw to make a 71-69. to 69. There's 3.1 seconds left on the clock, mm-hmm. but a big play was – Iowa got the rebound. She missed the second shot, and they got the rebound. If Connecticut gets that rebound, they've got a timeout. Yeah. They could have taken They have a chance. They didn't even play they for it. Ti- they got a they've timeout, got time. which would have moved the ball to half court, half court. I believe, with 3.1 seconds to go, and they still got a chance oh, yeah. to they tie They had a the chance, but game. they didn't even try for the rebound. They don't, get, no. they don't even leave the block. No, they, they, that, was a, that was a killer right there on the, on the rebound, not fundamentally boxing out and get the ball hey marcus how big a win was this for the ncaa women's tournament to get caitlin clark in the final game it's huge for them (laughs) it's absolutely huge and And i will guarantee you if it doesn't already up there that espn engineered the end of that game to happen that way to get her into the championship for ratings i'm sure it's it started yeah momentarily yeah but (laughs) And that official's driving a Lamborghini this morning. They call that. <laughs> yeah, she's got a bright red Lamborghini. She's driving back to. And wherever. the thing is, I, agree, I don't. I wouldn't say I often agree with Gino, but he. I mean, I understand his point. You could have made that whistle almost any play in that game, because of the way they were letting them play. Yeah. But I'll go back to don't look guilty doing it. You, I mean, there's an art to if you're going to do it, you can get away with it most of the time. But you don't throw it out there and set your face and throw the elbow and look that way about it. You've got to do it like Danny Ferry used yeah. to where it, you know, what are you talking about? I mean, all I did was slide my foot out and the guy fell over it, yeah. you know. Make it look unobtrusive. I felt sorry for her. Her last name was Edwards. You know, you know look, oh, su- yeah. look and then, surprised. And then, uh, she played a pretty good game. Yeah, she, she was a it. big factor inside. You know, in the basketball game. You know, but when you do it, look surprised, fall back a little bit like they hit you and dr- look like you're drawing contact. Don't lean forward into it like you're trying to be Dick Buckus. Yeah, that was a that was a brutal game. Listen, oh, they, 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 listen they let them play. There was bodies flying all over the place. Goodness. No blood, no foul. Huh? Most of the time. I mean, and it was effective, too. I'm wondering if we'll see the same kind of physical defense from South Carolina trying to stop Clark. Yeah, because really, that was by far the worst tournament game she's had. If they're smart, really, they will. The gal that was on her was it Goolers? Was that her name? That was on Beckers. The, Beckers, not Beckers. The girl that guarded uh, Clark was that Bueller? Or, I don't know. I can't they remember. rotated too, but I think. Yeah, it but was, I mean to tell you, they did one heck of a job. And of course, they doubled up some when you know when at the screens and so forth. They contained her, but she still got twenty six points. Yeah, but even they did though, a lot Even though she was denying. 0 for six, zero for six from three point shots at the half and. Man, she was throwing up 45-footers. Looked like desperation shots right before the half. But, you know, I think she had six points at the half. Six points at the yeah. half. She, they were doing such and a good job de- just denying her even touching the basketball. And a lot of uh, – she had some turnovers. A lot of, uh, Clark yeah, she had, had a lot of turnovers. Way more turnovers than her yeah. normal game. But when the game was on the line, when the game was on the line, she didn't really beat them with the, the shot. She beat them with the pass. She's you a great that? passer. She beat. She beat. She UConn found that little sophomore pass. that had had a great game last night. And her name's escaping me, but Stalky. Was it Stalky? Yeah, she had it. She was. She threw a pass into the lane, and literally the girl was not even into the screen, the view of the screen. Yeah. And comes de- and she's there to catch the pass and put up for a layup. That was she, Stalky. But she, when she throws the pass, 
They're, she's not even in view. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you what, uh, what impresses me about Iowa is the fact that Caitlin Clark gets a lot of publicity. But last night you had Paige Beckers. It was really billed as the Paige Beckers versus the Caitlin Clark matchup last night. But that really wasn't the storyline. The storyline in that game was the other players. Yes. On both teams. That was the that's that's who won the game. Well, they're great teams. Yes. And and I think it uh, uh, the other players on Iowa, they uh, they respect Caitlin Clark mm-hmm. and Caitlin Clark respects those other players. Yeah. Hey, those other four players or five or six players that's out there coming off the bench that's on the floor with they're more than just Caitlin Clark. Oh, what I'm trying she to say. knows they where are. they are at I, all times. I don't care what the media wants to make out of it. As far as Caitlin Clark breaking every record, scoring record, passing, da 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 da, they're still. I was still a team. They really are. They re- yeah, which is impressive to me. Well, it's time to make some picks. Yep, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, North Carolina State and Purdue. Purdue's trying to hang a championship banner. They're trying to to gain one there on uh, Indiana. Right now it's 5-0 to zero on NCAA championships in the state of Indiana where the Hoosiers got five, I believe, up. Purdue doesn't have any. But uh, Purdue's a nine-point flavor against uh, Cinderella, North Carolina State. And Cinderella, North Carolina State, has surprised Marcus everybody up to this point. They're going to surprise uh, everybody against the Boilermakers today. No, they will not. Purdue and Zach Eady are going to win this, and they're going to set the matchup everybody wants to see. Yep. Donnie Moore, you got uh, the Boilermakers? End of the road for for the uh, Wolf Pack today. Yeah, I'll bet that hurts you to, v- to vote for an Indiana team. <laughs> Where's Troy? Me. Where's Troy at? Troy Troy would be going, I got the wolf pack all over the place. It, it <laughs> doesn't bother me. I'm, I'm, I'm just picking the best teams. Yeah, yeah. well, they're going to tip it off on TBS at 6.09 p.m. 6.09 p.m. on that game. Uh, so I guess we're going to get to bed at a decent hour. The Nightcap's going to start about uh, 8.49. Alabama and Connecticut. Connecticut's about a 12-point favorite. Both of those spreads are pretty healthy, Marcus. Yeah. They are, and there's a reason for it. And I will, I will say I'm going with Connecticut. I think Alabama could give Connecticut a really good game, but I just don't think they're capable of finishing Connecticut off. Donnie, you got any respect for the Tide? Uh, for this game, no. Yeah. Okay. No, they, they're, they're – their season's coming to an end tonight. So. Uh, this is going to be a little harder to pick. South Carolina and Iowa. Donnie, you go ahead. Whew, man, I'm telling you. It's not time for the Fast Signs commercial. <laughs> I know, but I, <laughs> I wish it were. No, uh, this one's tough. This one's tough. I, I wish I could I could have an easy pick on this one, but I can't. Uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to vote with my heart instead of my head on this one. Uh, I'm going to pick Iowa. All right. I'm taking South Carolina. Uh, I, yeah. I, I just think they're just too good inside. Yeah, well, they're, they are. You're right. And yeah. I, Iowa's going to have to take better care of the ball. They're going to have to shoot the ball better. And uh, I don't think they're going to – I don't think that Caitlin Clark's going to get the defensive pressure that she got against Connecticut. I'm taking Iowa. I'm, I'm thinking Clark's won I everything so. else. She's won everything else. Time for her to win the hardware. She was there last year. This is this is her this is her night to shine. So very few yeah. runners up from the previous year ever come back and win it the next yeah, year. I know. That's I true. Know. Tough pick, but uh, we'll see what happens. All right. Hey, the final whistle is uh, blown, and that'll do it for today's edition of the Go T Sports Page. Thanks to Aaron Ishmael back at Loud Media, our host of the Blue Tick Ta- Tavern, and all our sponsors. For everyone here on the Go T Sports Page crew, until next Saturday, this is Mike Edwards, the Greenfield Gunner, wishing everyone. Good sports. And that's the final whistle. Join us again next Saturday for the Go 